Hello, Bible readers. I'm excited about today's text. It's about Cain and Abel, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. To live in God's world on God's terms is enough of a problem. We saw that with Adam and Eve. Uh, they didn't do real well with the challenge that that is. But to live with God's other creatures, specifically other human creatures, the brother, you could say, uh, encapsulates that whole idea. That offers even more of a dilemma, as Cain and Abel show us. One thing Brueggemann wants to make clear about the Cain and Abel story is, is that it is far more than a morality play. To boil it down to just murder is bad, you'd be missing a whole lot. Uh, the murder itself takes up less than one verse. Readers already know it's bad to murder your brother or really anybody. So this story isn't about the murder. What interests the storyteller is the destiny of the, mur the murderer, uh, a, a destiny that's then haunted by a skewed relationship with God. And that relationship is skewed because a brother, a fellow creature human, has been violated. In his commentary, Brueggemann says, This story must be told rather than explained. Attempted explanations are likely to hinder and miscommunicate rather than illuminate. Remember, we've talked about this a little before, that stories are open-ended, and they're meant to provide an experience for a listener, not provide a bunch of answers to academic questions. So I'm just going to highlight some pieces that pop up as one would be reading the text itself. So verses 1 to 2 simply set the stage. Cain, we hear, is firstborn. And we're going to see with Isaac and Jacob, the firstborn doesn't fare very well in Genesis. Cain, by the way, means to get or to create. While Abel means vapor, nothingness. So Cain is celebrated and well thought of, while Abel seems to be the one who is dismissed. But they're kind of ironic names given to them. The struggle between the brothers, between to create and nothingness, uh, the struggle there is really just a backdrop, though. The real action in this narrative is between Cain and God. Both brothers come to worship. Both bring their best as, a, as an offering. Both anticipate acceptance from God, and yet Notice that Cain doesn't do anything, Abel doesn't do anything to get himself killed. Instead, as Brueggemann says, the strange God of Israel chooses. Like, there didn't have to be a choice. It could have been, they're both good, they're both bad, whatever. But instead, God accepts one and rejects the other. Why, we would ask. Well, again, like other themes in Genesis, this story is not interested in abstract, abstract origin stories. Why does God accept one and reject the other is not what's important to the storyteller. Even if that's what we wish the storyteller would answer. Uh, what's important to the storyteller is what are the faithful and faithless responses a human like Cain has or could make in the face of rejection. The observations that Brueggemann lifts up here are, life is unfair, God is free, life is not a garden party but a harsh fellowship among difficult siblings made harsher by the mysterious ways of God. He goes on to notice all through Genesis, God is there to disrupt, create tensions, and evoke a shadowy side of reality. It's almost like Loki, the Norse god of mischief, is what uh, our god looks like in, in lots of Genesis here. The crucial part of the story happens in verses 6 and 7. God basically asks, So, I see you're upset. What are you going to do? You can do well. Then you'll be accepted. You can also not do, not do well, for sin is lurking at the door. You must master it. So this makes it clear that what we said back in chapter 2 and 3 was correct. 
That was not a story about the fall, even though a lot of times we'd call that the fall narrative. God doesn't treat Cain as fallen. Cain is not a victim of some original sin where he can't choose and act for good anymore. He can respond faithfully. That's a choice. But it turns out this sin is too much. Sin here, by the way, is not simply the breaking of rules. Sin is a force. Verse 7 says, this sin has a desire for Cain, almost like sin lusts for Cain. That's kind of what the Hebrew word would usually be used for, almost like a, a romantic, animal-like lust. And Cain gives in to sin, like he's been perverted by it, is how Brueggemann talks about it. The rest of the story, uh, once Cain makes the response that Cain makes, uh, the rest of the story is a lawsuit. And he's found guilty because he is guilty, but he's also graced. And as much as we learn about sin's force of lust and Cain's ability to still choose, but then choose poorly, it's also a story when we see God as one who offers justice and mercy. He judges guilt and gives grace. This God surprises again. This God is free. We see again. Journal about Cain and Abel. Uh, send in questions you might have. Stars, question marks, hearts. Tomorrow we're going to go through a bigger chunk. 417 to 917. So it's five full chapters. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places.